Coming up. I stand in the engine bay. What do I do now? I'm stuck. We discovered that Bob the Builder worked on this engine. That is a nail! And we go from simple troubleshooting to... Oh, there goes my wallet. Hello and welcome to M539 Restorations and to part 2 of Project Chicago. In the previous episode we took delivery of this glorious and quite broken Alpina B7. The third has issues, many of them. The biggest one we are trying to figure out right now is the issue with the engine. The check engine light pops up immediately and we are getting the code for camshaft timing. We did a bit of troubleshooting back then but nothing yield results. We did exclude a couple of things but now we're gonna dig deeper. And we left off thinking that the Vanna solenoids might be bad or the eccentric shaft is worn or the cam timing itself is messed up. In the meantime, I received service records from Antonio, the previous owner of this car, and he had work done on it in Texas by a few different shops. And now we're going to look at those invoices and that'll help us get an idea of what's been done on the car. And hopefully by the end of this episode, we can figure out what's wrong with it or maybe even fix it. Come on in. These are the service records that I have and they go in chronological order. This one is from 2019 and the car had 126,000 miles back then, now it has around 128. Shortly after buying the car, the previous owner experienced a severe oil leak while driving and the car shut itself off. Apparently the oil pressure sender was damaged, causing a big oil leak and oil sprayed everywhere in the engine bay. Very unusual, but that's the only thing that makes sense on this invoice. The car jumped timing and this shop retimed the engine and got it back on the road. 600 miles later, the car had a rough idle and misfire, spark plugs and ignition coils were replaced, they did a compression and leak down test on the engine and found cylinder 7 to be weak. After cleaning it, they got it within spec and they also replaced the alternator. 300 miles later, oil and filter service by a different shop and you're not gonna believe this, but the check engine light is back. Told you this car is a giant check engine light and this is where we see for the first time the code that we have now. This shop actually did some nice troubleshooting, they swapped around vano solenoids, camshaft sensors, reset DME adaptations and none of it helped so they suggested taking the car back to the shop that originally timed the engine. Then invoice for window regulator and battery and final invoice that you saw in the previous episode where they quoted the owner over $11,000 to fix the Alpina. Based on all of that and the code that we're getting, now we're going to remove the valve covers, check the timing and inspect the eccentric shaft and go from there. Now we're going to remove the supercharger belt. We need Torx T60 for that. Okay, the belt is off. What do we have? Made in Mexico. I could go for tacos right about now. And cerveza, of course. The belt does look good, doesn't need to be replaced. I guess now we can check if the pulley has play. Nah, not even a little bit. It even sounds decent. Now we should be able to lift it out. This thing heavy? Not really. Remove this. Now I'm gonna get the broken CCV out of the way. Come on. <clears throat> I think it's completely falling apart. Several million cables here. Now I can remove the Valtronic actuator. Now we're gonna remove this base plate here. Oh. Oh, it's completely loose. I'll remove camshaft position sensors. Now the harness for the ignition coils. It doesn't say what brand they are. So I'm gonna go and venture that these are cheap eBay coils. So I'm gonna have to replace all coils all around as well as the spark plugs. Get the harness out of the way. Looks like we need to remove this fuel line here. Uh oh, lost forever. Again. Nope, there's not enough room to pull it out. The eccentric sensor is in the way. If I break that thing, it's quite expensive. Dipstick. There we are. That was a bit of a faff. Remove the old gasket. Let's have a look-see. The exhaust cam looks good. On the first look, the eccentric shaft looks okay. Now we're gonna remove the valve cover on the other side and then we can start checking the timing. I think we can unbolt this and set it to the side. 
Oh, the coolant sensor is broken. So now I'm going to disconnect the ignition wiring harness in the control box. There are two connectors here. Oh, it's out. Nice. Look at that. Torn. So I have a look-see here. This is bank one. That's the eccentric shaft. The gear. Bank two. The eccentric shaft. Gear. So now we need to get to the crank to lock it in place. Throttle bodies out. Now I'm going to remove spark plugs all around so we can rotate the engine easier. That's all of the spark plugs removed. Now we're going to remove the oil line. Now we need to gingerly unclip it. There it is. Now we need to rotate the engine until it's at top dead center. See that notch on the vibration dumper there? That needs to line up with the hole in the engine. Then we can put the special tool through it and lock the crank. This is the timing kit that I bought, 180 euros. And this is the tool that we need to use to lock the crank. The engine is a TDC when on cylinder one we have exhaust cam lobe pointing diagonally up and intake one diagonally down. You can see that the tool is in place, fully seated. Now we need to verify that the camshaft and camshaft adjuster are locked in place. That should be the case whenever you turn off the car, but the repair manual specifically says that to double check that. And we're gonna do that by taking a spanner on the hexagonal head and rotate it against the direction of rotation, which is anti-clockwise, and just verify that this is locked in place. And it is. Now I need to check the exhaust side. This one we rotate clockwise. It's locked in place. Beautiful. So now we're gonna get the timing tool and verify the timing on bank one, because that should be the good one. This is the tool for the cam on the intake side. It should sit flush. There we are. You can see that the tool is sitting flush. Not a very good angle, but you can see the same on the other side. Remove this tool. This is the tool for the exhaust side. So bank one timing is good. Now we go to the side where we have the code. On bank two, when the engine is a TDC, you're gonna have cam lobes on cylinder number five pointing upwards opposite of each other like that. And now we're gonna do the same thing, verify that the cams are locked in place with the adjuster. Yep. Intake is good, perfect. This is gonna be decisive now. If the timing is off, that's gonna result in a lot more work. If it's correct, then we have an issue somewhere else. All right, the intake side or the inlet. The intake side is perfectly flush. Now the big one, the one that was constantly complaining. Oh my, how is that? I'd say that's off, wouldn't you agree? That's ridiculous. The code is correct. Bank to exhaust side, the timing is off. Why? I couldn't tell you just yet. We need to inspect further. It could be that the shop that did work on this engine in Texas didn't time it properly, but I don't think so. It could be that it was low on oil or there's a problem with the chain, guides, tensioners. And I know what you're thinking, low on oil, jumping timing. Funnily enough, I found three separate threads on forums yesterday, exact same scenario, N62 engines skip timing on bank two exhaust side. And in those cases, it was because the engine was low on oil, alternator bracket seal blew out, and it skipped timing. And all they did is retime the engine, fix the oil leak, and it was good to go. So I'm not really sure what to expect here. Now we're gonna remove the timing cover, retime this camshaft, Rotate the engine several times and just see how everything else feels and looks, the guys, the chain, drop the oil pan, and then based on that, decide what we're gonna do. Either put it back together or replace the timing chain and guides. Let the good times roll. Now we're gonna remove the compressor bracket. How am I even going to remember how this goes back? Everything is so tightly packed in this engine bay, it's pretty ridiculous. Coolant hose out. Now we're gonna remove this pulley here. <clears throat> And this pulley is good. I hate this intercooler. I think we can pull it up. No. 
Oop. I'm going to remove vano solenoids. Now I'm going to remove the belt. Now I'm going to unbolt the alternator. Okay, so now we're going to remove the timing cover. The timing cover is unbolted, I believe. Houston, we have a problem. Let me bring you in. Have a look at the top of the guide here and compare that to the picture that I'm going to put on the screen now. Do you see it? Yes. That timing chain guide is bad. A piece of it has broken off and it's missing. And that is a clear indication that the guides on this car are going bad. There's no way around it. We need to do the timing chain, tensioners, guides, and everything else while in there. That's brilliant news from my bank account, but at least now we know what we need to do. So this is about to become very involved because this thing needs to come out as well. And then tomorrow I need to find someone with mobile AC machine to remove refrigerant from the system. And then I can unbolt and take this thing out of the car. I think I'll need like three people to lift it because there's a special tool that you attach here and here and then you use an engine crane and lift this thing up. I do wonder how heavy it is, probably a lot. Now we're gonna put this camshaft back in alignment just because and then we're gonna proceed and remove the oil pan. We need to release the cam adjuster bolt and hold the camshaft with one hand and do this with the other. Now the jig is sitting perfectly flush. Now get yet another tool. Screw it in by hand. Now I can torque that bolt to 20 Nm. The spec is 80, but since we're taking that off anyway, 20 will do for now. Good. Now we're gonna rotate the engine two times. Perfect. It's locked again. So the engine is in time now. Let's put it back together. No, wish we could do that. All right, let's drain the oil and then I need to clean up the shop and make space because we're about to blow this thing up into a million pieces. Nothing particularly interesting in the oil filter housing. <laughs> to be honest with you, I'm not even sure if this oil pan was ever off. The bolts look untouched. Give a few love taps. There we are. Nice. Hello. What's up? Uh oh, we have a bolt in here from something. Where did that bolt come from? Oh, I can see some stuff in the pickup there. All right, let's go to the table. So this is what we have in the old pan. That is a nail. What? I thought this was a bolt. Nail. Someone tried to nail this engine the wrong way. That I didn't expect. Pretty sure b and in their construction of this engine didn't use nails. But that's, that's hilarious. What else do we have here? Oh, I can feel something there. That's, I wanna say plastic. That could very well be the piece that we're missing on that guide or some other guide. Leave that for collection. Just, what's that? I feel more stuff. Un momento, por favore. So I have a funnel with the filter. Let's see what we find. Oh, ho, ho. that is a big one. Did someone lost the tooth in here? You know, I found some interesting stuff in oil pans before, but this one <laughs> takes the cake. The mesh filter, it's properly dirty, oil pan as well. But here, winner, winner, chicken dinner, we scored big time. We have everything you would expect to find in an oil pan, a nail, some plastic, metal, silicone, more plastic. I mean, we can make lunch here, people, a proper manly lunch. So this piece of metal here, it has pretty rough surface on the back and a line which tells me it's not from the rod bearings. It's probably chain was rubbing somewhere and flaked off like from a wall or oil pan or whatever or the guide. This is definitely a piece of timing chain guide. Then more plastic, silicone, black one, gray one. And that I cannot explain, really can't. Now I'm gonna remove the pickup tube because I can see there's more delicious stuff in there. 
And here I thought that this Alpina won't need much to get it back on the road. So these are the findings that we have so far. Oh, hello. More guides. Silicone, I guess. More guides. Yeah, so what do you think of that? Drop a comment. Have you ever seen something like that in an engine before? That still worked. If this wasn't there, the engine would go boom because the oil pump would swallow all of this and that's the end of that. Weirdly enough, the oil filter didn't have anything in it. That was in the oil pan for a very, very long time. But I can't explain the nail. I just can't. So I'm gonna put back the oil pan so the engine is not open and it's not constantly dripping. But this was fun. We should do this again. The next step is to remove the intercooler. So I'm gonna remove this tube here. And I consulted with the guy that rebuilds these and he says that some amount of oil that comes out of here is normal. They all do that, even brand new superchargers that Alpina made. So I expect something to come out of there, but let's see how much. And he also says that with every oil change, you should drain the oil from there. I guess that's not too bad. Ah, nice. So here's how to drain coolant the civilized way. Brilliant. Slow though, but... Okay, I'm bored, come on. I believe we need to disconnect the power steering line, which is that thing. Get ready for a splash. And dash. Ooh. So now I'm gonna go around and disconnect all of the lines that are attached to the intercooler, radiator, power steering cooler, transmission cooler, oil cooler. There's a million of them. And I think I can lift this. Doesn't seem that heavy. <clears throat> I'm gonna see if I can separate the condenser from the intercooler. Ha ha ha, look at that. I broke the nipple on the radiator here in the corner. So, new radiator it is. How is it all connected? I don't understand. So I just press the high pressure side. Empty. No refrigerant in there. So the AC is empty. That's convenient. Yeah, empty. We are safe to remove the lines. So I don't have to chase someone with mobile AC thing to discharge it. Ah, muy excelente. And only power steering line here and we can pull this thing out. So the repair manual says to use apple picker to lift this thing out of the engine bay. But let's see if I can do it on my own. I've just, there's too much crap. I think I can get the condenser out of the way, make it a little bit easier to lift. This is an absolute nightmare. There's a holder here that I need to unclip. And then if I do that, the thing is just gonna fall on my head. So let's do it anyway. Okay. That's the holder. Okay, you're coming out. Don't go back in now. I knew it. that thing is hitting on the bottom, isn't it? It is stuck. Pipe is in the way. Just lift. This is unbelievable. Come on. Thing. You useless. I don't care anymore. If something breaks, it breaks. Oh my god, it's out. By the way, do you know how much this intercooler costs? 3,000 euros! It's pretty much what I paid for the car. It does, exceptionally difficult. An absolute pig of a job. So luckily we didn't have to disconnect the... <sighs> luckily we didn't have to disconnect the oil cooler, but I really didn't want to mess around with the transmission oil. Now we have a ton of space for activities. The next step is to remove the water pump thermostat, then timing cover on bank one, and just everything in front of the engine so we can get to the lower timing cover. But now I'm gonna call it a night, gotta go home, eat something, and then I'm gonna start ordering parts. It's a brand new day. Last night I spent three hours ordering parts for this thing and nearly 3,000 euros, so that's great. And I know some of you are going to ask me, why don't you just drop the entire engine out of the car for this job? And if I had a two post lift, I would certainly do that, cause you can unbolt the subframe and then the whole thing with the transmission comes down. But on a four post lift, you can't do that. And to take the engine out this way, 
it would just take way too much time. So I'm doing it this way. I also looked at the repair manual that says that in order to replace the timing chain guides, you need to remove both cylinder heads. But that's just a ton of work that I don't want to do. And I feel it's not necessary at this point. And I did a bit more research and it turns out you can do it without removing the cylinder heads, but it's going to be tricky. I'm going to need to unbolt the subframe, remove the upper oil pan, and then you can get to the guides. Although one guide on this side is a bit problematic because of this thing here, but it's doable. I'm also going to remove the intake manifold. Then we're going to replace the coolant pipe and just reseal everything around the engine. And hopefully by the time we're done, this thing is going to be leak proof. I'll mark the connectors, thermostat. Out you come, thermostat. Excellent. More coolant. Fingers. This thing should come out now. Long bolt, very long bolt. Now we're gonna remove the vacuum pump. Should come out, no, yes. Now the vanna solenoids. Now we're going to remove the upper timing cover on bank one. So all the bolts I'm storing in the parts that I remove. That way I don't mix anything up. And this guide here is not broken. This one looks good. So now we're going to get the harness out of the way. I think we're going to lift it up and tie it to the hood. Unplug that one. Something like that. Step into the Alpina. Don't break the radiator. <clears throat> All right. I believe this is how professionals do the work. Okay, it's out. What do I do now? I'm stuck. Put it on the headlight. Yes. Oh, it's a good thing I have long legs. Oh, it is out. Nope. Careful. Say hello to the valley pan. This is where that magnificent pipe runs and leaks. So you're gonna replace that. You can do it when the timing cover is off. And you can see the valves look pretty clean. Yeah as they should. So now I'm going to vacuum them up and plug those holes. Okay, I'm utterly confused by this AC belt. There's no pulley or tensioner to hold it in place, but it has complete tension. So how do you remove it? So I found the removal instructions. Apparently you need to pull the belt towards the front of the car, then rotate the engine at the crank, and then the belt will slowly come out of the pulley. To put it back on, you need some special tool to compress the belt here. So it stays in there. But anyway, I don't want to rotate the engine now because it's a TDC, so I'm just gonna tick that off. There we are. Now we're gonna remove the vibration dumper and the pulley. There it is. Let's see if I can get the alternator out of the way now. The alternator is out. Okay, that's out of the way. Remanufactured Bosch. All right, now we're going to remove the crank bolt because the step after that is to brace the engine, drop the subframe, and while it's nice and stable now, we're going to remove that bolt first. So this is the special tool that goes here. So that thing is torqued to 100 millimeters and then three times 60 degrees. So you need a very big breaker bar or fully charged Milwaukee, hopefully. It's in beast mode, so let's see what it does. Ooh, my ears are ringing. Need to get ear protection. So 
It's moving. Ha! Easy. Best 350 euros I spent. This whole set, charger, the thing, and a battery. No affiliation with them whatsoever, but they just make phenomenal tools. Look how big that is. I think I'm gonna put back the vibration dumper. That way I have more leverage to pull the hub out. Okay, let's try now. <coughs> doesn't wanna budge. So I jerry rigged this weird looking puller because the hub doesn't wanna come out. Normally it should come out very easily. So I was properly rusted on. Before I put the engine support bar, we're gonna remove the valley pan. Now we're gonna remove knock sensors and I'm going to replace them. If you remember in Project Dubai, I did the intake manifolds, I didn't replace them. And then later I ended up having issues with this and I had to remove the manifolds again. That's nice. Majority of dirt and dust and sand is vacuumed up and it's not gonna end up in the engine. Now we should be able to lift it up. Easy as that. That's the valley pan that we are going to replace. That's the promiscuous pipe, famous for leaking and requiring to disassemble the entire engine to replace. And don't worry, this is a vet shop vac, and you can already see that this seal on the back is leaking because it's already filling up the valley pan. I unbolted the power steering pump so it can come down with the subframe. Now we're gonna go underneath the car, get the front end up in the air, and then we're gonna come back and put the support bar on the top. How nice is that? that massive brakes in excellent shape I might add now we're gonna remove engine mount bolts will this one be long enough it sure won't oh crap what do I do now thing is not long enough took me a little while to figure out how to put it well, let's see if this is gonna work This was tricky, but doable. It's good. It's not going anywhere, but I am. I'm going home to eat dinner. Quite hungry. So I'll see you manana. Morgan, this thing is still firmly in place. Didn't drop the engine. So let's go underneath and start unbolting more stuff. So here's the stuff that I see that we need to remove. There's some lines on the subframe attached here. Need to unbolt those. Gonna unbolt the sway bar links and the steering column from the steering rack. And I think that should be it, but I'm not sure. Perfect landing. There's a connector as well that I need to disconnect. Perfect. <laughs> Now I'm gonna remove this panel here. Oh, wow. Oh my God. That's everything disconnected and now we're gonna slowly start unbolting the subframe. That's it, a little bit of tension and now we can remove subframe bolts. The goal is not to remove the subframe completely out of the car, just enough 
to where I can remove the upper oil pan. Now we're gonna do this very slowly because I have to pay attention if something somewhere is caught and we still need to remove some of the stuff. Okay, it's come down. Nice. All right, awesome. Subframe is out and resting on this plate here. Lots of space to remove the upper oil pan. So now I'm gonna unbolt this transmission line, see if we can get it out of the way. So first I'm gonna drop the lower oil pan again. Now I'm gonna remove these oil cooler lines, then the alternator bracket, compressor, I think just unbolted, and then the upper oil sump. Whoa, there we are. Hello, oil. So we're gonna put that in a glove. That way dirt and dust cannot enter these lines. And zip that. There it is. These two O-rings that we need to replace. So to remove the alternator bracket, we need to remove the engine mount arm as well. Ah. There we are. Here you can see the alternator bracket seal that's also annoying for going bad and it's a ton of work to replace it. So we're gonna do all of the seals around the engine. I think that's all of the bastards removed. Is there another bolt somewhere? Oh, the oil dipstick. Come on, oil dip get out. There we go. Oh, careful. Careful. Don't scratch anything. And we're out. So this is the bottom end of the Alpina. Nothing particularly interesting here. Pretty clean, not varnished. So now I'm gonna bolt the AC compressor and then we can go up top. I think that should be enough. I don't have to unbolt it all the way. And our final obstacle, the lower timing cover. Oops. Here we are. Incredible amount of work to get to this point. But now you can see everything. All of the chains, the guides, and this is the coolant pipe seal that failed. I mean, just look at it. It's absolutely destroyed. And there's a small hole on the timing cover here. So when this thing fails, the coolant goes out of here. But you really need to fix it because what happens if, uh, if that gasket fails, then the coolant is gonna go straight into the engine. So definitely something that you need to address. Okay, I'm gonna put the hub back so I can undo the oil pump chain. There it is. I cleaned up the surface of the hub, so it slides in and out now easily. There it is. That's the oil pump chain. Now I'm gonna remove the timing chain tensioner. That's that big guy over there. Now this one here. So close. There it is. Now I can lower down the engine because it needn't be this high. Now we're gonna remove this top guide. Now we need to remove the vanos or cam adjusters as repair manual calls them. So we need to grab the cam there and hold it. <clears throat> Man alive. 
That's tricky. That one is loose. Gotta be very gentle here because the cam lobe is right next to it. You don't wanna touch that with, uh, with the wrench. <sighs> to sound like a porn. Don't worry people, I'm just loosening Venice bolts. Remove the bolts all the way. Easy. So now we're gonna remove this guide here. There it is. So this guide here is the problematic one, the one that requires removing this head. So let's see how we fare. I'm gonna remove that bolt here, then try to slide it out. If not, we can undo the screw on the back and get it out that way. What did it break? Oh, broke the guide. Nice. Okay, so I have no idea how I'm gonna put the guide back in. So putting the guide back on is going to be interesting, to say the least. On the bright side, I do know it's possible. I've seen people do it, I've seen pictures. So I'll do a bit more research and see how to do it because I'm, I'm not removing that head. No freaking way at this point. This car has eaten enough money and I have no idea how it's gonna run after we do all of this work. So removing the heads, it's not gonna happen. Because if you remove the heads, then might as well strip the entire block and yeah, that's not what we're gonna do at this point. Now you gotta remove the chain on bank two. Something. No, it's a piece of the guide. So I just spoke to a friend who has a local shop and they're dealing with these engines and M cars all day long. And he says that the trick to getting this guide back in is to shorten this bolt a little bit. Then you can flex the guide just enough and start threading in this bolt. So that's how we're gonna do it as well. This is such a stupid design that they made this one part and not removable. And that's it. That is everything that needs to be removed removed. Chains and the guides on the table and these are original parts to the car. They have a date stamp from 2007. These from bank one are good, nothing broken there. This one however has some chunks missing on the top and then this one has a huge piece missing and that's the plastic that we found in the oil pan. So all of this is going to be renewed except the Venus units. Those are good and this is the situation as it is right now. This table is half full the intercooler, it's right over there. There's more parts underneath the car. The wheels are somewhere over there. And then that first row on the rack, that's all full with parts and that corner as well. And new parts are yet to come in. I think we're gonna park this episode here. At this point, I'm waiting on parts and it's gonna be at least a few days before I get everything that I need. And then I can continue with the reassembly. This was a lot of work, a ton of work actually, and more work than the rod bearings on D60M5. Just because a lot more needs to come out, the front timing cover, the stupid intercooler, that was just horrible. I'm really not looking forward to putting that thing back in. And hopefully in the next episode, you're gonna hear this engine run again. That is, if I remember where all of the bolts, nuts, connectors, connections, hoses, lines, and everything goes back, there's just way too much. So it should be a fun episode as well. If you enjoyed this one, give it a thumbs up. Apparently that helps the video. Might as well subscribe if you haven't because there's going to be a lot more content on this car and all of the other projects in the background. The E30 is actually done. It's registered. The door is fixed. I just need to reassemble the trim, clean it, and then it's ready to hit the road. But I don't have time because I'm working on this majestic vehicle. So thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.